Good morning, everybody, and happy Ash Wednesday. That's not exactly the right thing to say. Um, I came from a parish before I came to St. Michael where Lent was like the most indulgent season of the entire year because we did a daily lunch for downtown and a preaching series, and I said it was the only place on God's creation where you gained weight in Lent. Um, and so it kind of became this joyful thing, and now I have to recalibrate myself. Now, you're not supposed to say Happy Ash Wednesday. That's not quite right. Um, but today is Ash Wednesday, and I hope that all of you who are here present will consider staying for our noon service. And if you are not able to stay for our noon service, we have multiple other services this evening. And especially those of you joining us online, I will be doing Ashes to Go this year. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, did, I started this a couple years ago, then COVID, and so we haven't done it. But essentially what I do is I, we take the ashes that are blessed right here on the altar at noon, and then I walk over into Preston Center and kind of interrupt everyone's day. Um, <clears throat> I dress in all of our stuff and kind of scare nice people who are just trying to eat lunch um, <clears throat> and have a chance to explain what the ashes are and hand it out. And when we did it a couple years ago, we have this great picture in front of Susie Cakes in Preston Center with like 20 people in line waiting for the ashes. It was fantastic. Um, we had people from the parish who brought elderly parents with them who can't get around very easily, who have ambulatory issues, and they just pulled right up in the parking space in the car and I just reached through the window. It was great. And so if you need that, then you can join us out there. It's a pretty day. Um, and so even if you're not here in person, we'd love to see you here at some point or in Preston Center about 1230, um, we should be over there. Let me see. A reminder that questions are great. We have a few questions we're going to um, look at today that we received during the week last week. And so if you're watching on a social media platform here in person, ask your questions during the class. And if you're listening afterwards, I don't know if you know this, we have a few hundred people who will listen afterwards during the week to the podcast. And so feel free to email those questions to me or to bovemussy at um, stmichael.org and we will get those questions collected and then answer them next week. So we are still in Leviticus, the genuine pleasure of the Bible, um, and we will continue to move on through. Today we'll be looking at chapters 19 through 22, and I'll explain the scope of our lesson in just a minute, but let's start with a prayer, and we'll be on our way. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, on this blessed Ash Wednesday, we ask that you help to open us up to make space for your spirit to fill us. That as we begin your holy season of Lent, we can do so with the confidence and the courage, knowing that you walk with us every step of the way and that even in death, life does not end, but is only changed. And that we continue to grow in our relationship with you. I ask your blessing today on our world, a world that seems scarier this week than last a world that seems uncertain, and yet we know that you are in the midst of the uncertainty, that you are with us in the mess. Help us to maintain faith that what we see is not all there is, and that goodness will triumph. Be with our friends who need your healing touch today. Help buoy them with people who care for them, that they know that you are ever-present. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Today our lesson in chapters 19 through 22 are going to be in three parts. We're going to begin with the moral holiness, then shift to resisting human instincts, which is always a challenge, and then the holiness of priests in particular. We are in the section of Leviticus, chapter 17 through 25, that is really the holiness code. So Leviticus is all about how do you do this stuff? We know that Moses led the Israelites to Mount Sinai. They are at the foot of Mount Sinai. They are essentially receiving instructions on becoming God's holy people. They are, at this juncture, transitioning to what we know as the Jewish people. Before this, they were Israelites. Now they are really becoming Jewish. And what Leviticus does is gives them, in a sense, a how-to guide to being good Jewish people. And so much of Leviticus is dry because essentially it's do this, don't do that. It's specifically about how one might sacrifice, use the tent, go into the synagogue, and such and such. In this kind of second half of Leviticus, 17 through 26, we get what 
scholars just simply call the holiness code. It's, in a sense, what to do to be holy people. And so for the next couple weeks, we're going to be looking at the holiness of being God's people. So moral holiness, resisting our human instincts, which you can probably guess what that is, and then the holiness of priests in particular. I want to begin with a question from last week. Sally asked about chapter 16 in Leviticus, and chapter 16 was about sacrificing and whether or not the prefigured, that the transfiguration of Christ was prefigured in chapter 16. I am going to take a stab at transfiguration was not perhaps exactly what Sally meant to ask, and that it was about Christ's sacrifice. Um, If, Sally, if you're out there, um, if you actually meant transfiguration, then let me know, because I'm not entirely sure what you mean by that. Um, So I'm going to kind of pivot and say sacrifice. And we talked just a moment about this. Yom Kippur is essentially established in chapter 16. That day of atonement, that holiest day in the Jewish year. And atonement in general is set as a, a high goal for Jewish identity. Yom Kippur is that moment in the year where you kind of clean everything up. We don't, we don't really have this like that in the Christian tradition, um, although you can equate some of that with uh, today, Ash Wednesday, maybe Good Friday. There are ways in which we do remember our fallibility, kind of our profound fallibility, not just daily problems, but I remember growing up Catholic, um, we always had to go to confession before Easter. And so we would line up outside the confessional. It was the only time, you know, as children, we ever did that kind of thing. Um, And it always kind of confused me. It wasn't as if I killed animals or was an arsonist or something like that. I wasn't entirely sure what I was supposed to say. So I would go in and, you know, bless me, Father, and that sort of stuff. And then I would say, I talked back to my parents. I argued with my sister. I mean, it was, I was sort of boring. Um, I was not terribly bad. And so I used to have to just kind of say these small things that didn't seem like a big deal. Um, And so because of that, Yom Kippur always seemed a little odd to me. But then I became an adult and I realized, oh, you can do bad things. And so we have in the Jewish tradition established here in chapter 16, this big, profound moment of atonement. Fast forward to Jesus. The first century followers of Jesus were trying to figure out who Jesus was, what he meant, why he mattered. Because yes, he was a good teacher. He obviously was able to perform miracles, but was he more than that? And as their theology began to evolve, they began to link Jesus to this idea of atonement, this Yom Kippur style atonement. And Jesus became the once and forever sacrifice for all of us. And so the idea of Yom Kippur, where every year the entire community came together and essentially tried to rectify wrongs and reconcile with each other and all the other stuff, spiritually speaking, theologically speaking, Christ has done that for us once and for all. That doesn't mean that we don't repair relationships that are broken or try and reconcile when things go wrong, but the separation of God is now closed forever. For the Jewish people, Yom Kippur, and sacrifices throughout the year were really about moving closer to God, reconciling with God, being able to be in relationship with God. And through Christ, the early Christians began to understand that Jesus did that once for us forever, and that our faith in Christ is actually all we need. We don't, therefore, need to do things like sacrifice in the temple and go through days of atonement and all the other stuff because the atonement through Christ was done for us once. So that's what I think Sally was asking. (laughs) Sally, let me know if that's not true. Um, The other question that I received is, well, actually, it was a two-part question. Cheryl asked if there's a difference between sin offering and guilt offering. So we were discussing how you make offerings, and that's an easy one. Leviticus talks about sin offerings and guilt offerings. A sin offering 
is an offering to try and reconcile an intentional wrong. A guilt offering is seeking to reconcile an accidental wrong. So we accidentally do wrong things and hurt people all the time. So a guilt offering is really sort of like, yeah, I, that happened, I did that, I'm sorry. It is the premeditation that creates sin that then needs a sin offering. That is really what Leviticus is explaining. So that's the difference. It may look similar in the offering itself, but there's a difference in intention. Intending to hurt a person is just a different level than accidentally hurting a person. Okay, second part of Cheryl's question is really about giving. She asks how our giving can be channeled and why we don't talk about giving in general outside the church as much as we talk about giving to the church. Um, and how does God view our giving in our place of worship versus someone who might simply give outside a place of worship for charity? It's a very good question, and I'm going to name it and then save it because at the end, when we're discussing chapter 21 and 2, it's going to dovetail perfectly. And so hold on to that question because it is a good one. And Episcopalians love this kind of question because people tell me all the time, well, I might give 10%, but it's 10% total. And so the tithing to a church might be a portion of that, might be the greatest portion of that, but I see my giving in general to anyone at any time anywhere. And Episcopalians love that stuff. And so we're going to talk about why that's not actually what God's talking about. Um, and you can disagree with God. It's not me. I'm just going to tell you what God says. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Let's jump in. We're going to look at moral holiness. We're going to start in chapter 19 of Leviticus. Turn to chapter 19. And I'm going to skip some verses as we go through just to save some time. So we're going to start with verse 5. <clears throat> chapter 19, verse 5. So just like every other chapter, it begins with the Lord spoke to Moses and said, verse 5, when you offer a sacrifice of well-being to the Lord, offer it in such a way that it is acceptable in your behalf. It shall be eaten on the same day you offer it or on the next day, and anything left over until the third day shall be consumed in fire. Jump to verse 9. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare or gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the alien. Verse 11, you shall not steal, you shall not deal falsely, and you shall not lie to one another, and you shall not swear falsely by my name, profaning the name of your God. Verse 15, you shall not render an unjust judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. With justice, you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor. Verse 17. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor, or you will incur, incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And we'll pause there. So this is, as I noted, a whole lot of boundaries. It's guardrails around what to do and how to do it well. Chapter 19 really deals with moral behavior. It's moral holiness, in, in particular around conflict and resolving conflict. So what shifts here for the Israelites and then for the Jewish people is an understanding that conflict engages the entire community. At the time when the Israelites were here at Mount Sinai, it was most common in that region with other tribes and other groups that doing something wrong or having conflict would be turned over in the tribe to the elders. Elders within tribes were very important. They were essentially the council. They were like the Supreme Court of the community and a very select group of elders would essentially decide what is and is not right and justify things and rectify wrongs and all of that sort of stuff. The Jewish identity shifts. What Leviticus is setting forth is a big paradigm shift where the entire community is meant to be engaged in resolving conflicts. That's a big deal. We certainly know how it feels to, when we do something wrong, we don't necessarily want to tell everybody about it. We would love to keep it quiet, maybe between you and the other person, that's it. 
blasting it to everybody is never anyone's desire. But there is a very strong sense of hopefulness, of communal anchoring that is being set forth here in Leviticus. So first, what Leviticus says is that individuals should act, should avoid acts that cause conflict. That kind of makes sense, right? The best way to resolve a conflict is not to have a conflict. And so they say things like, don't steal sheep. Don't cheat in the marketplace. Don't take advantage of the vulnerable. Don't lie to other people. All good things. And I should note, <clears throat> for us, we're talking about American Christians, kind of in that Protestant Anglican tradition. All of this stuff sounds very normal. Yeah, don't lie. Don't steal. Don't cheat. All of that sounds good. Your grandma told you all of that. The reason why is because of this. And so it's not meant to be redundant to what we do. I want you to know it didn't come from nowhere. It actually anchors itself in this Jewish identity where the community is responsible for each other. I found it interesting. So how many of you would say that you kind of were raised in a more Southern environment? And I'm not talking Texan because y'all know Texas is not like really Southern. Um, it is not, listen, all you Texans who are like, wait a minute, Dallas kinda, but eh, Texas is kind of that hybrid of Southern Western. Um, and so it depends, it depends on where you were. So I think if you were raised in Dallas, you could have been raised kind of Southern, but not necessarily. Um, and if you were not raised in the South, you were probably not raised Southern. But if you were, interestingly, I would say that a Southern way of being is actually quite communal. Everybody knows everything about everybody. And you really can't hide when people do something wrong. And that's kind of great because in a sense, you're accountable to everyone else. Now that can be abused, certainly. And we probably all have some example of that. But in the best of, in the best of a community, seeing each other honestly and raising each other up and surrounding each other when mistakes happen is kind of beautiful. And in a sense, that's what's being put forward here. Don't wait for the council of elders to actually right a wrong. Do it yourself and do it in your family and do it in your neighborhood and do it in your little city or tribe because everyone is better for actually resolving conflict together. But it does say, try not to you know, get in conflict in the first place. But if you do, what Leviticus says is if you're the victim of wrongdoing, you, victim, have a responsibility to go straight to the person who wronged you, to air this out, to actually make it known, or else it will begin to fester. And going to get revenge, or you on your own seeking to fix it, is not the way it should be. Essentially because all of us on our own will continue to make mistakes. We are much better together. And it goes back to just general communal identity. We are a communal people. You've heard me say in here many times, can you be Christian on your own? Maybe, but it's not a good idea because we are simply not good at that. Left to our own devices, disconnected from other people, we will not be our best. When we are together, we will actually behave better and we will treat one another better and we will learn from each other and on and on and on. And so that communal nature is really being established with great sensitivity and clarity right here in Leviticus. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I think it's stuff outside. Um, now let's talk about the moral direction of this passage. We have some guardrails, yes. But did you catch what happened in verse 18? Verse 18 says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Hey, what's that sound like? That kind of sounds like Jesus. It is easy for Christians to think Jesus made that up. No, he did not. Jesus was a really good Jew. And as a good Jew, he made this so central to his message because basically, if you do that, like everything else takes care of itself. If you love your neighbor as yourself, then that's kind of it. Everything else is details. What we see here is a very clear establishment 
of a precedent that, although good, will begin to be stretched and twist, twisted and molded and, I dare say, even perverted, such that by the time Jesus comes on the scene, Jesus kind of goes back to basics. And when he says, all of these laws that I know you mean well have confused you and have set you down a path that is just too far away from the purity of what God really wants, which is love God, love your neighbor. That's it. What's, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, love God and love your neighbor. He didn't make it up. He's essentially going right back here where God started it all with the chosen people creating the Jewish nation. God says, just love your neighbor as yourself. And we've talked about this in here as well. We don't like human, humanly. We do not like just love. It's not good enough because we want to put boundaries around that. We want to define it. Love who and love how and love when. And if someone does something that is unlovable, is it okay not to love them? No, you just have to love. And we want to know you love who? Nope, everybody. And when, all the time, and on and on and on. We, that makes us uncomfortable because we've all lived, we all live in an imperfect world and we understand that people do wrong. Do you love them even though they've done wrong? And what is interesting to me about this is that second part where it says, if you're the victim of wrongdoing, you go to that person and you try to sort it out. What I want to be clear about what Leviticus lays, lays out is that love is not passive and love is not weak. For Leviticus, love is extremely strong and it is through love that you go and you fix things. So if someone wrongs you, you go back to them and you solve that problem because you love. And when someone does a bad thing, you go to them and you call them out on it and you make sure everyone else knows about it so that they can reconcile it because you love them. We term this tough love. It is difficult to go deeper than that because in every instance or example I've, I thought of before this class, there is some problem we're just messy, we're human, we're gonna make mistakes, we're, we need to do our best and that's okay. But what Leviticus is saying here is it's not the passivity that we might understand when we look at Jesus. I mean, let's be honest, Jesus kind of let himself be tortured and killed. So there is a very easy way to understand Jesus as a pacifist in a sense. Leviticus is not quite that. For Leviticus, it's much more about the strength of love, doing the right thing because of love, even if the right thing is hard, even if the right thing may hurt someone now, it's almost like an intervention for an addict. That's loving, even though they don't wanna hear it and they may feel insulted and they may even leave. You're doing so because of love. Okay, I think I'm gonna pause there because that's probably good enough. Any questions or thoughts on that? I have to end a little early today because, you know, it's Ash Wednesday. No? Okay. Let's keep going. Part two. Resisting human instincts. Yep. Oh, do you know? Hey, look at, look at chapter 19, verse 20. <laughs> I didn't know which chapter this was. Does it start with if a man has sexual relations with a woman? Thank you, okay. I realize I'm doing so many chapters today that I didn't note that that was still chapter 19. All right, chapter 19, verse 20. Here we go. If a man has sexual relations with a woman who is a slave designated for another man but not ransomed or given her freedom, an inquiry shall be held. They shall not be put to death since she has not been freed, but he shall bring a guilt offering for himself to the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting, a ram as guilt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him in the ram of guilt offering before the Lord for his sin that he committed, and the sin he committed shall be forgiven him. When you come into the land and plant all kinds of trees for food, then you shall regard their fruit as forbidden. Three years it shall be forbidden to you. It must not be eaten. In the fourth year, all their fruit shall be set apart for rejoicing in the Lord, but in the fifth year you may eat the fruit, that their yield may be increased for you. Verse 26, you shall not eat anything with its blood. You shall not practice augury or witchcraft. 
You shall not round off the hair on your temples or mar the edges of your beard. You shall not make any gashes in your flesh for the dead or tattoo any marks upon you. Verse 29, do not profane your daughter by making her a prostitute, that the land not be prostituted and full of depravity. Verse 31, do not turn to mediums or wizards. Do not seek them out to be defiled by them. Okay, we'll stop there. So some solid advice, right? Don't make your daughter a prostitute. Check. Um, <laughs> sounds, sounds so good. Um, we can get into the details, yes, which you probably will. You know, you've got, on the one hand, you've got, don't make your daughter a prostitute. You're like, yes, that sounds good. On the other hand, don't eat fruit from a tree until year five. Why? So it's kind of uh, the point here. The Jewish people are being set apart. We've said this for the last couple weeks. This experience at Mount Sinai is taking many of the ideas that were shared or understood in certain ways of tribes around the Israelites and differentiating the Israelites from them. The way that they treat each other, the way they live together, the way they worship, what they eat, how they act, all of those things it's less about the specifics, although for some groups they would say the specifics really, really matter, but it's less about the specifics and more about the difference. They are different. They will act differently, they will look differently, they will behave differently, and on and on. God is setting them apart. We can, and we have in this, in this class before, note that perhaps the differentiation is rooted in something that makes sense, whether that's it's medically wise, or it just keeps people healthy, you name it. Yes, that's probably true. The theological reality here, though, is that the Jewish people are really meant to not make mistakes like the tribes around them. They're really meant to define themselves in a new and different way with Yahweh. In doing so, the point of being chosen is to invite others in to join you. That is essentially where the Jewish leaders kind of make the biggest mistake and where Jesus steps in in the first century is to say, you're not chosen because you're special. You're chosen to be special. And so everybody can do that. And so everybody needs to be invited into God's reality and into God's economy. And so that's why Christianity does not remain within a particular ethnic or tribal group, but instead goes out and says anyone can be in it. Now, I will tell you, that did not happen immediately. You may remember when we studied Acts about the Jerusalem Council. There is a moment when people ask themselves the good question, do you have to be Jewish to follow Jesus? Because everything about what they were understanding Jesus to be was the fulfillment of the Jewish Messiah. Well, why would a Gentile care about the fulfillment of a Jewish Messiah. And so they wrestle with that in the first century for a few decades before they finally land on, no, everybody can be in the pool. Everybody can be invited in. You don't have to be Jewish. And some of that stuff is like rubber hits the road stuff. Do I have to eat kosher in order to follow Jesus? Do, do men have to be circumcised in order to follow Jesus? Do we have to, and on and on and on. And ultimately, they say no. Well, some say yes. It depends on who you're talking to. But essentially, the big shift is no, everybody can do this. Whoever they are, are welcome in. Here, we see Leviticus continue a list of don't do stuff that might seem natural because you are different. And that's the big message. Now, there are a few things here that... Mm, what I really want to address is the section about the way in which sexual relations and or prostitution is, it seems odd and out of place. I want us to remember a few weeks ago when we were in Exodus chapter 21, and I'm just going to read this passage to you. Don't worry about turning to it. Um, but Exodus chapter 21 verse 2 says this, when you buy a male Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years, but in the seventh, he shall go out a free person without debt. If he comes in single, he shall go out single. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out alone. When a man sells his daughter as a slave, she shall not go out as the male slaves do. 
If she does not please her master, who designated her for himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people since he has dealt unfairly with her, yada, yada. So remember when we did that a few weeks ago, I said it sounded harsh to us, but what was happening was an intentional shift toward trying to honor people at a higher level. We can easily say as modern people that is not honoring at a high enough level, agreed. But it is an improvement. And the improvement is essentially saying you have to deal fairly with people. It doesn't matter who people they are. So what we see in Leviticus when it says that do not profane your daughter by making her a prostitute or if a man has sexual relations with a woman who is a slave designated for another man, inquiry shall be held. The issue here is around purity and impurity, and it gets at an economic problem. Put yourself back in this time period. If you are poor, and by poor I, don't, I do not mean money. Poor, by poor I mean you are, your housing is insecure, maybe you don't have one at all, you cannot produce food for yourself, nor can you go buy food others have produced, so you are literally starving. What is one good option? And by good, I mean effective, not good, I should say. What is one way to essentially gain some economic security? Prostitution or selling yourself into slavery. So it's so profoundly imperfect but if it's that or starving it's you know it is what it is and so part of what Leviticus is addressing here is an unfortunate reality that some families are just going to be in this position where they are about to die of starvation they have an option where they can go work as a slave for someone who has money and therefore gain security or they could even look at their children and say go serve these people, and by serve, I mean, who knows, whatever. Um, and all of that should not then wreck the future of the entire family. That's what, so Leviticus is not saying, don't do those things. What Leviticus is saying is, we should not allow a momentary poverty to define a family forever. And so when we look back at Exodus and say, when you buy a male Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years, but in the seventh he shall go out a free person without debt. Essentially what they're establishing is, you know, times can get tough. And you might need to do whatever you need to do to survive. But that should not then determine the entire future of your family forever. You should be able to work in a particular way that is perhaps not the way you wish to work and essentially get out debt free, be healthy, be established, and change your life and the life of your family in the future. You should also not send your children in to work hard and then have their futures uncertain or insecure. And what I really mean there is you cannot have sex with children. That's really what Leviticus is saying here. That if, say, you've got, you know, children who can go and work in the fields or clean a house or, do, or mind the goats, they need to have the integrity to remain pure, sexually pure, so that once they do their work, they can then go out on their own and form their own families with integrity and with honor. Yeah, there you go. Any questions or thoughts on that? It's all sort of like, yes. Correct, that should be the way it is. Um, but we may not fully realize that just wasn't always the way children were treated. All right, good. Section three, the holiness of priests. Jump to chapter 21. Chapter 21, we'll start verse 1, and then I'll jump around a little bit. 21, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the priests, the son of Aaron, and say to them, No one shall defile himself for a dead person among his relatives, except for his nearest kin, 
his mother, his father, his son, his daughter, his brother, likewise for a virgin sister close to him because she has no husband, he may defile himself for her. Jump to verse 10. The priest who is exalted above his fellows, on whose head the anointing oil has been poured, and who has been consecrated to wear the vestments, shall not dishevel his hair, nor tear his vestments. He shall not go where there is a dead body. He shall not defile himself, even for his father or mother. He shall not go outside the sanctuary, and thus profane the sanctuary of God, for the consecration of the anointing oil of God is upon him. He shall marry only a woman who is a virgin." A widow or a divorced woman or a woman who has been defiled, a prostitute, these he shall not marry. He shall marry a virgin of his own kin, that he may not profane his offspring among his kin, for I am the Lord and I sanctify him. We'll pause there. Chapters 21 and 22 really go into the separation of the priests from the lay people. And I noted maybe two weeks ago, three weeks ago, that there is a very clear hierarchy of expectation between the priestly class and the other people. Remember when we talked about when people do wrong and the way they go and reconcile, if you are a, an ordinary person, that was what Leviticus said, then you can give sort of a small thing, like a female goat. If you are a ruler, a governor, then you've got to give a better thing, like a male goat. But if you are a priest, then you have to bring a male bull. There is a huge jump in expectation around priests versus lay people, regardless of the lay person. Whether that lay person cleans houses or is the king, they're all in a certain tier. Priests have a much higher level of expectation around their behavior. And so what we see here set out in chapters 21 and 2, and we'll look at chapter 22 in a second, is the difference between the priestly class and the lay class. Now, Leviticus was written by the Levites, and the priestly class for the Jewish people were from the tribe of, can you guess? Levi. Okay, so if they are writing about themselves, which is essentially what is happening here, then is it a surprise they think either they are so very special or that they should be separated from the other people in a ritualistic way. Not a surprise. But this has lived out for centuries in the Jewish tradition. By the time we get to the first century with Jesus, we see that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the people who come around Jesus and question him and challenge him, they are very much separated from the other people. When Jesus goes and calls his disciples, he's calling essentially good Jewish people, but they are kind of the lowest of the low, tax collectors or fishermen or you name it, even though they are Jews, there is such an extreme hierarchy at the time Jesus lives for the Jewish people that they're really considered kind of garbage. And so Jesus calling these people is confusing because he's obviously smart, he's well-spoken, he is a miracle worker, he can kind of do anything. Why is he spending time with those people? We see this over and over and over again in the Gospels where a Pharisee or a Sadducee says, why are you touching this person or talking to that person or eating with those people? And essentially what they're saying is, you're like us. You should not be doing any of these things. Healing on the Sabbath, you should not do that. Speaking with tax collectors, absolutely not. Touching women, this is where that kind of differentiation comes from. This code for priests is something that becomes more and more extreme as the centuries tick forward, and something that Jesus essentially tries to undermine. It's not that priests don't have a particular role, but the extreme way in which they are separated from the other people is, was never the point. The point, and this is what I discussed a few weeks ago, is that when you have a particular responsibility within a community, then that is just simply true. If I were to do something really bad, I can absolutely remain as a beloved child of God. I can be redeemed through Christ. All of that is, is check, check, check. But can I stay a priest? Mm, probably not, because I've undermined this relationship. That is the essence of what Leviticus is talking about. When you have a particular role within a system, 
And that could be a parent to a child, that could be a boss in a company, that could be a priest in a congregation. There is actually a higher level of responsibility and expectation. And if that is broken, if that trust is broken, it does not mean that you as a person can no longer be redeemed. It does, however, mean that you likely cannot serve in that role within that system anymore. It's just the way it is. And Leviticus gets at that reality in a very explicit way. I do not think that many, interestingly, I think that a lot of times theologically today in the 21st century, people would take issue with this. But I think that the truth is we all know this is real. And whether we theologically think it's right or not, it just, it is what it is. And we can deny it all we want, but it doesn't mean that it isn't true. Let's look at chapter 22, verse 21, just to finish this out. We'll talk about holy offerings. Chapter 22, verse 21. When anyone offers a sacrifice of well-being to the Lord in fulfillment of a vow or as a free will offering from the herd or from the flock to be acceptable, it must be perfect. There shall be no blemish on it. Anything blind or injured or maimed or having a discharge or an itch or scabs, these you shall not offer to the Lord or put any of them on the altar as offerings by fire to the Lord. An ox or a lamb that has a limb too long or too short, you may present for a free will offering, but it will not be accepted for a vow. Any animal that has its testicles bruised or crushed or torn or cut, you shall not offer to the Lord. Such you shall not do within your land, nor shall you accept any such animals from a foreigner to offer as food to your God, since they are mutilated with a blemish in them, they shall not be accepted in your behalf. So this is kind of funny. Um, but essentially what is happening here is, <laughs> put yourself in, I think this is, this is hilarious, and this gets at um, Cheryl's question about giving. When people make sacrifices to God, is God there to talk to them about it? No. Does God actually say, yes, that looks good, or no, that does not look good? No. So this whole idea of sacrificing to God when God is a being apart from our reality, can you imagine that people at some point would start to think, I mean, God's not there to say no, so why don't we take the three-legged goat and sacrifice them? Because what's God going to do? Say no? I mean, it's kind of funny, because essentially what they're doing here is we like, do not cheat God. Do not give God the dumpy stuff, like the one-eyed donkey or whatever. I mean, you've got, you've got to give God the good stuff, because God deserves the good stuff. It is our obligation as, as thanksgiving for the gift of life itself, period, that we give back to God the best. It does not matter if God is literally there. Is God actually eating the animal that you sacrifice? No, that's not happening. That is not the point. The point is that we say thank you. Leviticus is super clear. It is not, you do not sacrifice the animal or give of your grain or your fruit or all the other stuff for God's benefit. You give for your benefit. Now, now we will answer Cheryl's question. Why do we, as a church, speak so much about giving? It is not for God's benefit. It is for yours Think of it just like prayer. We do not pray because we are informing God of something he does not know. That's not it. We do not pray because maybe we can convince God to cure the cancer or to help us with the job or on and on and on. No, that's not what it is. We pray because when we do, our relationship and dependence and thanksgiving for God is deepened. We do not give because God needs money. God's good. He does not need money. We give because it is in the act of giving that we are formed. 
that our faith deepens, that we know truly, truly that our hope is in God alone. That's it. We have this gift of life, regardless of any bad things that have happened to us. We are here, and it is gift. And when life is our gift, we say thank you. And every one of us in this room can give, you a, give God a nice list of all the bad things that have happened that we would like to have not happened. Not the point. The point is that in every way, we can say thank you. We can say thank you through shouts of hallelujahs. We can say thank you through tears of grief. We can say thank you in every way all the time. And that is good for our souls and for our spirits. When someone says to me, I give in all these different ways to many different charities, and I might give most to the church, I always say, if it is appropriate, and I won't sound like a jerk, church is not charity. You can absolutely give to anyone you want, and that is wonderful. When you give to your faith community, you are giving in thanksgiving to God. We see right here in chapter 22, when you offer a sacrifice to fulfill a vow, you give the best. Then, if you offer a sacrifice as just a free will offering, I give whatever you want, because that's just on top of it. We should be giving at a high level, sacrificially, every year, and throw a 20 in the plate on Sunday. That's not the same thing. That's just a free will offering. Don't worry about that. You want to give a little bit to the women of St. Michael, you want to buy something for I Believe in Angels, you want to make a donation or a relief fund for Ukrainian relief, all of that is good. That is all in addition to. That does not have to be your best, because you've already given your best. The vow that is integral to our relationship with God is the best we have. And if it is short of the best, we are selling ourselves short. It has nothing to do with God's need. It has everything to do with our need. And I say this to you, all of you, knowing that that is probably not the way most of us were taught. And so it can be challenging to hear. But I hope that at least, whether you choose to do it or not, you understand the kind of spirit through which it is being offered. And know that it's not modern. It is very old. From the very beginning, here at the foot of Mount Sinai, God's chosen people are being compelled to give their best in thanksgiving just like we are. And with that, I will say, send us your questions. I do not have time. Um, you can go and ponder and pray and maybe give a little better. And that's always right. We accept pledges anytime during the year. So y'all, come on. Um, and to say, it is Ash Wednesday. Service at noon, 5, 7, and then out in Preston Center today. And I hope that you have a very blessed Lent. I will see you next week. Bye, everybody.